Good afternoon, AI fans, and welcome back to beautiful Atlanta, Georgia. We are here midway through day two of our three days of coverage on theCUBE. My name is Savannah Peterson, here with the ineffable and brilliant Dave Vellante. Dave, I'm super excited. Hey, I'm too honest. You know me by now. You know what an honest person I am, Dave. <laughs> Perhaps to a fault. And so, uh, you know, that we're honestly excited about our next guest. No cowboy hat for me this time, but David, thank you so much for coming to hang out with us and talk Power Edge. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me back. It's good to see everybody again, so. Yeah, exciting. so you're a regular. Lots of new announcements coming out, lots of yeah. advancements, not even just announcements. What's new on your side? Power Edge has been a conversation on the table, but. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is my third supercompute. Mm -hmm. I think a couple of years ago, we were talking about a product that, you know, the XE9680 went on to become the most successful product in PowerEdge history. So we were excited and then we followed that up last year and now we're here talking about some great stuff. I think what has been interesting for me is as we've talked to customers in the past few years is that they're seeking AI solutions, but they're seeking AI solutions of all shapes and sizes. So they really need things that fit their existing data centers. There are certainly use cases where customers are looking to build new data centers, what I would call greenfield, but we have to meet customers where they are today and provide them with powerful AI solutions. Now you can do that in some of the compute-based solutions that we've been building with PowerEdge. We unveiled a few things a few weeks ago at uh, OCP Summit. Mm -hmm. We are talking about some other solutions right now, and really it, what we're talking about here is the breadth of solutions where we can deliver AI on compute as well as purpose-built large-scale AI solutions. And we're doing that with systems built on fifth-generation AMD, Turin, mm -hmm. and so we're really excited to have uh, new servers, new rack-based servers that are supporting latest generation in turn processors. What I'm hearing from you in that, it, you know, we hear a lot of hype about the big, huge systems. That's not always the solution for everyone. It seems like, and you've had some intel, you've talked to a bunch of different customers. Right. There's a variety of solutions that the market needs. Tell me a little more about that. You know, it, one of the simplest ways to break it down is, I mean, we're walking around the conference and, and there's a lot of liquid cooling or alternative cooling. Like cooling. you said, it looks like a plumbing show. A little bit like a plumbing show. That's, and that's great. But at the same time, we have customers that aren't ready for that in their data centers, and we talk to those customers. And so we're really focused on providing compelling air cool designs that they can fit inside their existing power and thermal footprint inside their racks, inside their data centers. Uh, and, and then it's a matter of crafting you know, the right AI solution and use cases and the right sizing that's going to work for that type of environment. And so I'll give you an example of maybe some of the design points that we had to focus on with our latest uh, rack servers, our prior rack servers. Um, we knew that providing the highest core count possible in an air cool package would be really, really important because you need that high core count if you're going to run, say, a, a, an, an inferencing model like a small language model on, on that platform. And so we're supporting 500 watt processors in an air cool package very high thermal uh, in, inlet air temperature. Uh, and we're doing that because we've designed the system, we've redesigned the system from our previous generation and we've added that type of thermal improvement. So we had the capacity to support that, that 500 watt processor, 192 port. So how do you wow. do that? Is that, is that software IP that, that, that optimizes the cooling? You don't just throw big fans yeah, at question. it, right? So uh, it's, it's a yes and a yes, right? It's, it's, uh, really intelligent design, heat sink designs, uh, focusing on fan performance and making sure we're using high quality fans. And then there is a software element because you have to have the right uh, embedded uh, uh, baseboard management. And we get that with iDRAC. We have world-class management with our iDRAC controller. Uh, and you have software there that helps direct uh, 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 airflow in an intelligent way through the system. And you know, a lot of times you'll look at the specs on a system and you'll say, well, it can support this, but there's a, a bunch of fine print. It's like, well, maybe you can support a high you know, TDP, but it needs to be at 25C or maybe 17C, which is what it feels like in here right now. It's pretty cold in here. But it, you know, <laughs> you gotta have a really cold inlet temperature to support that. We're looking more like 30C and 35C. And I, you know, I always have the opinion that we've got the best uh, thermal engineers in the business. And so when we're publishing our, our thermal testing results, we're really excited to have that, you know, to see that we can provide robust configurations that use that intelligence that we're talking about uh, to provide the highest configuration in an air cool package without requiring liquid. So what's the spectrum of, of AI systems look like? You know, it used to be yeah. big, medium, small. Boom, 
Yeah. That was the old server days, yeah. and it's much more granular now. So what's it's, it look like? Can, can, Paint it, a picture it's, for it's us. From a, simply put, I would say it's from eight cores to 27,000 cores, maybe. Uh, casual. Casual <laughs> differential casual, there. Casual differential. Yeah, it's yeah. quite, it's quite and, a spread. And, and I'll, Call it a I'll explain why. You know, if you go to our booth and, and you look at the systems, we have our large-scale um, purpose-built AI servers, and we have really compelling compute inside those. We do have churn built into those platforms, like the XE7745 or the 9685L, and uh, we're obviously supporting uh, large you know, GPU deployments there. Um, at the same time, you kind of walk left to right down that table. I'm putting in a plug for the booth, by the way. You walk left to right on that table and you'll see our rack server as well. You can support uh, anywhere from eight to 192 cores in a rack-based server. If you want to run, say, video analysis or video inferencing on the CPU, you can do that. And we have some customers that are already looking at how they do video analysis for like a smart city deployment. So that's a really compelling oh, cool. use case. Yeah. Oh, yeah. To, and you're running that directly on the CPU. You don't need any GPU. Now, if you want to graduate to, say, running um, um, RAG-type solutions where you're, you're augmenting your results, you can do that on high-frequency CPUs. You can do it on a 5 gigahertz CPU. You don't need to go deploy GPUs to do that. So we have support for that in our RAG servers. So you do have kind of a largest to smallest type of config. And then if you want to standardize on that rack server, you can do eight core count at the lowest end. And that's what we, we really partnered well with AMD when we looked at all the core counts we wanted to provide, the type of systems we wanted to provide. We wanted to give IT enterprise, enterprise IT customers that kind of um, cool. uh, large scale, highly adaptable system that can support a variety of use cases. And so that's what you get in like the R7725. You know, you just brought up something that I think is really important. I think there is so much emphasis on GPUs. I mean, I've even got a got GPU, a run GPU sticker on my laptop. But it's going to take a variety of different types of, of compute to solve the problems that we exactly. are trying to solve. And I yeah. think that that's one of the unique things. I bet Dave would agree. I'll turn it to you here for a second. Is, is that Dell is uniquely poised to support a variety of different companies. I mean, beyond your booth, which you just so lovingly plugged, you've also got your AI factory behind us. I got to go hang out in there, see a whole bunch of different demos. I got to talk to Andy, your your virtual AI yes. friend. And, and, and actually, uh, I need to put up the video for that. But I, I think that there's, uh, this is just kind of a pulse check question. Do you think the conversation around GPUs is, is overhyped or overshadowing alternative compute solutions? It's, it's, not, it's nothing like that, in my opinion. It's really helping spur the conversation. It's Ooh, I love the that. Hard, yes. it's, it's forcing the hard conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's forcing um, enterprises large and small. It's forcing the customers that we see here today to really think about what they want their next generation of data center to look like. Uh, we have some really compelling solutions that rack that's in our booth. The the uh, IR integrated rack scale solutions, the IR seven thousand rack, that is us designing, helping design data centers of the future that can accommodate both AI workloads as well as traditional core compute workloads. So I, I love it. It's good tension, and yeah. it, and it's it's the kind of tension we need. I think it, we we all have been to this conference for many, many years now, and, and we've seen it grow, and I think that's evidence of the tension that's being put on these different design elements. Well, and I, it, struck, it strikes me, David, are, are customers asking you, or are they telling you? And I would imagine some of the customers are telling you, this is what we need, big LLM guys. Mm -hmm. A lot of the enterprises, they're probably a little nervous right now. Wow, we yep. have to refactor our data centers. We have to, uh, liquid cooling, air cooling, what do, we, what do we do? They must be asking you as well. Absolutely, and, and, and they're saying, you know, the, the question is more like, hey, how do, I, how do I deploy and demystify AI solutions for my environment? And, you know, you're not, you know, please don't try to sell me a new data center. I've, I've got right. my traditional footprint. I've got an investment that I need to, that I need to continue uh, utilizing. And so that's where the, I, I, you know, the AI factory is no surprise. I love it. I think we do uh, really, really great things. We have reference architecture. We have validated designs uh, that, that run the entire spectrum. And so if we have, say, like a Llama 3.2, it's a, considered a small language model. I'm just giving you an example. A small language model. It's, it's 3 billion parameters. Uh, we can support like 100 concurrent users on just a standard two-socket rack server running uh, 128 core turns, right? 
And that's the kind of footprint because that's the exact same type of system a customer would deploy to run just their standard you know, IT infrastructure mm -hmm. as well. So it gives them a common install base and, and they love that. Yeah, that, that user experience has got to be so much more pleasant. Exactly. This is a really important point because the yeah. CIO mindset is I'm, I'm at point A, I want to get to point P, I don't want to break the bank, I don't want to rip everything out of there. How do I start? And and I think it, it's actually the workloads are, of, from an infrastructure standpoint, what I just inferred from what you said, David, it's, it's a VEN. It's not like two separate right. you know, silos. It's not mutually it's, exclusive. Hey, there's some overlap from an infrastructure standpoint yes. where we can support the traditional general purpose workloads and the AI workloads. That's right. Now the hardcore stuff, we got you covered there too, yeah. uh, but it's a gradual, maybe not gradual, but it's a, um, doesn't break the bank necessarily going from point right. A to point B and you don't have to hire a million consultants. That's right, the, the best validation of that is the, the questions we've been getting asked this week when they stop and they look at our platforms on, on the desk and they look at the two U rack server, they look at the one U rack server and their question is, how many how many GPUs can I support in this system? So say they, they do want to build something that's more GPU based, right? It's what can I support inside this system? And I do think that is validation of what we've been thinking that they want to standardize on a platform, they want to use CPU where they can, they'll use GPU where it makes sense and they'll build it into that platform and that's how they'll get started to your point. I think that's I think that's a great conversation. It, it's about that that plug and play and that usability, but also being able to adapt and evolve depending on the workloads or right. whatever it is that they're- And grow. Yeah, oh yeah, whatever they're trying to create. You mentioned smart cities and video a second ago, and which is an awesome example. Can you give me a couple other customer examples of how you're seeing your systems deployed? Sure, we have, we have some customers that are actually building large, they're actually doing some large language model development on top of just standard rack servers. So they're doing that. Um, I talked earlier about say, and we're actually, we have this video in the booth as well. Um, we have the RAG solutions where they're using a high four count CPU to perform just retrieval augmentation on just standard results from a large language model. And we're able to just package that up as a, I think that the, the demo that we did is like analyzing a legislative bill, uh, which, which sounds kind of, but probably a very uh, appropriate thing right now. But um, it's, a, it's a good demo because it shows what you can do just on a standard rack server. And so that is resonating, that's built out of a real world, world example. And we're able to just document that as a white paper. We've got that coming soon and customers can just pick that up and start using it. That's, yeah. I, you don't hear that phrase a lot, just pick it up and start using it. I know. When we're having a conversation about high performance computing. Yeah, that's the goal. It's that usability. Woof, it gets me excited. You mentioned that your thermal engineers are some of the best in the world. What are some of the challenges or processes they have to continually adapt to the new systems that are coming out? Wow. What's that iteration cycle like? The iteration cycle is all about the richness of configurations. And so earlier I talked about you might get a you might see that you can support a, a really high core count, high TDP processor, but it comes with a lot of caveats. Well, another one of those caveats is you can't put any drives up front, or you maybe you can't use a lot of memory because those are uh, especially drives that can impede airflow through the system. And so I would say that the twist and turn has been about the richness of the config, and it, it's not enough to just provide a. a, a a, a really compelling compute solution. It's got to involve these, the storage solution, it's got to involve IO out of the bag. We've got to provide, you know, in some cases where we're helping customers design like large scale object storage frameworks, you've got to have like 400 gigs of, of IO coming out of the bag. Um, you have to be able to support that in your thermal solution as well. And so we have these great matrices when we finish our testing and it's all, right now, it's all greens. It's looking really good. Sometimes it comes up yellow and red saying you can't have that config with that particular processor and they're you know we're doing a great job testing and putting the right requirements in place so that we can give customers a really robust solution with the thermals that they have in their environment today. David what do you think happens with server life cycles? I mean we talk about these things you and I were talking yeah. about, I got an old phone you have an old phone yeah. I really need a new phone. I have, I think, four PCs. Mm -hmm. I got three Dells and a, and a Mac. I have three I as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and you see the hyperscalers, they depreciate their asset now over, I think it's six years now. So they're getting a longer useful life, I presume enterprises are as well. Will AI compress that in your view, or do you think it's pretty much the status quo in terms of that life cycle, that, that user There's, life cycle? There's a power angle too, Aaron. Yeah, it, you know, this is a great conference to have that conversation because what 
what do H, what do HBC customers uh, seek? They're always seeking top end performance, right? And and when there's something uh, next generation that comes along, they want to take advantage of it. Huh. And and of course, AI being a, a, a close cousin to HPC, uh, you see the same thing happening. So good proxy, right? Mm -hmm. And and so now, they you know you've got this AI use case or AI environment that kind of looks and feels like HPC, where you're chasing latest greatest. So to answer your question, I think there's a there's a part of the data center that will be chasing that latest and greatest as enterprises adopt more AI. I don't know whether we compress those cycles or they just transform in a different way. And then there's going to need more stable parts of, of IT environments that maybe don't have or have similar you know life cycles to what we have today. But I do think that the similarities we see here are going to trickle down into enterprise environments and there'll be faster turnarounds because it, it has tangible benefits. Right. If if the models get better, if the results get better, if if the uh, benefit to the business gets better, it's going to be very tangible and very easy to prove uh, when it comes time to make an additional investment. And it's not like there's a correct me if I'm wrong. There's not like a big aftermarket, you know, for but maybe there is for for servers. You guys pretty much take them off the market, um, but maybe not. Maybe it's like the old mainframe days where they cycle through. What, what's that it, dynamic? You know, it goes back to the. You know, have a stable platform that is that is adaptable to other parts of the environment. Maybe today's uh, AI systems are tomorrow's, uh, well, using the two socket rack example, maybe that system today is running inside a data center, maybe it's running in, in a, in a uh, carpeted edge location later on, yeah. right? Because there's, there's plenty of remote, what we used to call remote office environments before we called it edge. But right. you know, there's there's going to be a need for bringing those use cases out into those carpeted edge environments as well. So yeah. it's a it's a potential example Maybe we use. Today's training system becomes tomorrow's inference system at, at the edge or something. Why like possibly? That. So, yeah. But, but if you have a standard platform, if you're building around you know um, uh, uh, a known compute platform, in my opinion, power is best known in the world, and you have a really stable uh, uh, life cycle for that server, then you can embrace all sorts of different models. All sorts of different models, different solutions, a whole bunch of stuff. I got two more questions for you. All right. You get to talk to some of the coolest companies in the world doing cutting edge stuff. It, taking off your power edge hat just for a second, what excites you most about our AI future personally? I wish we would connect it. My, my power edge hat is sometimes glued to my head. Yeah. So, sorry, <laughs> it's all right. what, what excites me most about, about just AI use cases or? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. I, I think, Anything that makes our life simpler, we instantly embrace it and, and we kind of self-select. And we've all figured out that smartphones make our life easier. Uh, we learn how to kind of give the right level of feedback of where it's maybe difficult for us. And, and, and now we have you know, different ways to manage screen time, for example. But we embrace smartphones because it gave us a tangible benefit and made our life easier. Um, I think the things that will make it easier for us to perform our jobs, that to live our lives are going to be the most compelling and exciting things, right? And I can't wait, you know, I think it's already having tangible benefits to me right now. I think it's only going to get better and better. Like I said, it has tangible benefits as the, as the performance improves, as the hardware infrastructure improves and the technology improves overall. I think it's going to be very, very exciting. And I, I think we are making, um, some really good cases. I think somebody said it the other day, um, he's a very well-known individual, his name's on the building, but he said, you know, hey, uh, this is the worst it's going to be. And it's yeah. only getting better from here. It's well, just a yeah. great quote. And, and, and I think that's what excites me the most is it's only getting better. It's only going to make things more e easier for us over time. So What a moment of inspiration. And I do love that quote. Jeez. Building on that, I may have asked you this back in Dallas, but I'm not 100% sure that I did. When we're hanging out at the next supercomputing, because this is um, our annual reunion, what do you hope to be able to say then that you can't yet say today? I think the outcomes we're going to deliver with our rack scale solutions, with our next generation systems, we will be talking about some outcomes that will just be mind blowing. And by outcomes, I mean, we are going to enable customers to be successful in a variety of industries, a variety of, of, of sizes, like I've, I've been saying, and we're, we are going to be talking about some things that I, it, it's, it feels like it's only a year away. It is only a year away, but um, I, I, don't, I, I don't think it's a stretch to say that, that it's going to be very surprising. And I, you know, I'm alluding to things perhaps, but I think we have some really compelling uh, conversations going on right now. We have the capability to deliver at scale 
in, in, a, in a way that is just going to accelerate customers' time to value. And it's just going to be awesome to sit here a year from now and have those types of conversations. So I'm hearing supply chain. I'm hearing ecosystem. I'm hearing innovation and in, in hardware. I'm, I'm hearing customer outcomes, adoption. Sounds like we have a package of all that stuff. And we have strengths in all those areas. Uh, and we're putting that all together in such a great way that I, I'm, I just, I can't wait to see it. It's going to be awesome. I can't wait to see it either. Right. I look forward to having our minds blown when you're able to reveal some okay. of the awesomeness that happens over the next 12 months. And frankly, I'm excited we got to have another mind-blowing and educational conversation together. David, thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks for having me. Thank, thank you, you Dave. Right. I'm, in, I'm in the David sandwich right now. <laughs> I feel very lucky. I hope your mind's just as blown as ours here during our three days of coverage on theCUBE. This is the middle of day two of supercomputing. My name's Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for enterprise tech news.